this concludes the main meat from all levels of thinking. The another thing we have to consider that man became worse than the beast in the field. Man actually became cannibal at one time. How far he did fall? Look how far he fell still. He fell from the divine nature spirit, the angelic principle of absorbing energy from the atmosphere, down to the point where he had to use plant life at night. Then he came down to animal form, then he went as far as human form. Then he went as far as human form, that's when the Lord really got angry and was drunk without the whole thing, because he was worse not than the animals. You see, he would not have destroyed men had he merely at the animals. And if the tendencies of the animals were not transferred to him, then man would not have gone to eat man. As he had one flesh form, it was no different to him than the eat his own flesh form. Man got a, that low in consciousness. And the evidence is in the physical world around us. So in destroying us, we have to reincarnate to learn the horrible lesson of our own ignorance. Now, people say that Jesus at meat and encourage eating of meat and fish. Jesus never had no meat and never had no fish. There is no mention or any fact that Jesus had any meat or fish. So they, they cite one particular example where he ate. And the example that they cite is that when he died and resurrected, he was on the edge of the seashore and the ship was coming in with his disciples and they recognized it near Abrasia, what they call those Habachi or uh, although spit, cooking fish and honeycomb. And he asked them, have you eaten? And he said, no. And he broke and gave them, and they did eat. And the question is, which did he eat? He didn't say he had the fish or the honeycomb. It merely said he broke and they did eat. His students were not completely relieved from their mental block. And the fish was the only source of sustenance they knew. They were have much vegetables, they didn't do much planting. So he gave them the piece of fish or gave them the honeycomb. To say he had the fish or he had the honeycomb, there is no mention which one he took. So we know definitely with any doubt that he still did not openly eat the fish. As to say, I eat the fish and you eat the honeycomb, you might decide it. You can say that like that. But uh, there are some writings by the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls in which it states that some of the disciples of Jesus after he had gone were strict vegetarians. To the point where they, wherever they went, they would make sure that the people who they were going to meet were non-meat eaters, especially the man Matthew. He carried and traveled very likely with his own food. And uh, in the case of uh, Peter being tested as to his sincerity of what he was doing. He called all the things that were supposed to be not eaten unclean. But the Lord of creation said, everything I made is clean. That means they were not made with the intention of uh, greed, anxiety, stress, and all. They were made simply as forms of creation. These 84 million by forms were all made. Now, 
What was it that man transferred to these life forms when he came out of the ark? Mm. So, man's electrical nature was projected into the kingdom to set them apart among themselves. And when man's fear is withdrawn from these kingdoms, then these things will live in harmony with themselves. So the animal then ceases to destroy you by recognizing what from you. The animal then seeks to destroy you by recognizing what in you. Because you did what to the animal? The law of cause and effect, as you sow, that you reap. So we set apart between the carnivorous now and the non-carnivorous by imposing on them this fear pattern. When all creatures were basically non-meat eaters. In the ark, there were no extra pair of creatures to feed the rest. They had to carry grain to feed themselves. And all creatures did eat of grain. The things that move on the face of the earth, that, are not, that were not of flesh. So all animals actually taste what? Yes. You take any animal, carnivorous, red rabbit, and uh, so-called uh, enemies, and put them all in a pyramid, and in a few minutes you'll see all acting natural without any animosity because the fear patterns are shunted out. And they would not care to eat each other. And they merely lie down and frolic and you can they'll eat beans or cook rice, cook beans. They're basically natural green eaters. We tend to separate them because of their intestinal structure and their canine fang in their mouth. And say that the one has a fang tear meat and the other one has a molar to grind uh, herbs or nuts to survive. Basically, the animal is a non meat eater. But the fear that we imposed upon them brought them into that level. Not too long ago, I saw a beautiful picture of a mouse, a canary, a cat, a bulldog, and a lioness all lying down in a cage. And the keeper said, there is no way to aggravate these creatures to hit each other. They all love to eat bananas. <laughs> it's interesting. You mentioned putting them into a pyramid. Is this the effect that a pyramid has, reducing fear? Mm -hmm. Are humans so? Yes. It not only has dive, one, uh, that's only one of the effects it will remove. Fear will be removed, but there are other things that will be, will be removed by doing it. And you have to get a certain height of the pyramid. Has any man brought him something to eat? And he said, I have meat to eat that you know not of. Yes, when I was a boy studying to be a priest, I, saw, I always suspected he had chicken up his sleeve and he was holding out on the boys. <laughs> <laughs> then he said, I have meat that you know not of. He was not inferring what we think as flesh. He was inferring a form of food or sustenance. I took that to be figurative. You see, the word meat is only in America 
in the link, uh, Anglo prose connotation, we use the word meat to imply animal. Meat is the old English word way back from the early Saxon period for food, sustenance. You see, that's the word sustenance. We use the word today to describe the cow. Yeah. Apart from the goat, the sheep, and the lamb, and the chicken. I took that to mean food. Yeah. yeah. He said, they were surprised he had sent them to get food. And they came back and they were surprised to see him refreshed as if he had eaten. Mm. Now where did he get the meat from? Where did he get the food from? That was what they were questioning in their minds. Where did the master nourish his body from? And I read it as a boy and studying the time. I thought he held out on the boys and had an extra spare piece of chicken somewhere on his sleeve and I'm not going to let nobody know. <laughs> Which is, you know, that's where you're hiding it in some way. Just kids, we used to do that. When we go to a school and uh, you hide your piece of chicken or something so that nobody knows you're eating, you live by yourself. But he said, I have nourishment or meat that you know not of. He was inferring that within his consciousness, he did not depend on the physical substances of solids and liquids in the form of food to nourish his mechanism, but he lived directly on divine current passing through the medulla, the audible life stream. That is why when he was tested or fasted in the mountain top of his own soul nature, he had mastered this principle when his own ego put the challenge for him and said, why are you fasting? Why don't you change these stones into bread, into food, into nourishment, and stop your fasting and be a real human being and be down to earth, be a nerdy person. Don't try to be too godly of everybody. That's a super ego conflict. But the consciousness merely replied, it is written, and these two words are important, written, it is written, these three words are very important, that man, that means this information has been written down someplace, that man does not live by bread alone, he doesn't nourish himself by solids and liquids, through mastication and absorption and by planting and growing it. But by every word, the audible life current that proceeds out of the mother God that passes through the medulla. So he had resources or recourse to that particular internal technique of absorbing sustenance from the atmosphere, which his disciples were not able to do since he was in that state of Christ consciousness already. The disciples had to work past that state now the disciples were not Christ realized, you see. And to be Christ realized is to get rid of your, all your desires. And so you have the power to crystallize desires, but not your own. Now, they were not in that state, so they had a desire. What were they desire? A desire to feed the physical body in the form of solids and liquids, which they call nourishment, meat, or food. He having no desire, this not being his home, He's from another realm of pure inner awareness. So his body is not dependent on this environment. He was like Teresa Newman in the autobiography of Yogi, living strictly on divine essence. And he had the capacity to recharge the body cells by virtue of biofeedback. In the yoga language, it means that he was able to switch the energy around by love. In modern technology, he knew how to go from beta to alpha. We are only changing words to say what is happening inside. And then we can go from one level to the other, we can do these internal movements. So we don't have to depend on physical substances to regulate. His disciples could not go into those states. They weren't trained sufficiently, they weren't disciplined sufficiently. They didn't break away from their habit patterns, their cravings and desires. They still crave in a literal way, in a physical way, for the physical things of the world. To nourish the physical symptoms that the body produced. He had risen above hunger, he had risen above sleep, 
he had risen above all these basic five movements, that he was able to switch this thing along inside. They didn't rise above it, they had to struggle with it. And when they were able to do it, then it's a different story. He had already awakened the Kundalini energies in his spine, which is the Holy Ghost, or the Pentecostal movement, is the awakening of the Kundalini. But in the Pentecostal movement, it happens unconsciously in the person. In the spiritual man, it's consciously turned on. This is the difference. When the Son of Man is lifted up, I'll draw all men unto thee. When the energy is raised up, that's what the Son of Man is, from the Lord Chakra up to the top of the head, then this power is working through on a conscious level. When it comes down as a comforting thing, since you can't do it by yourself, it comes on by grace, and that's what the Pentecostal experience is. The Pentecostal experience is something descending upon you without any control, and suddenly you find yourself in that state, and by virtue of your love for God, you attract it down to you. If you don't trigger it off inside and say you have control, because it doesn't work by control. It's when it's turned on by control, you know. Now, in the case of Catherine Coleman, she is developing the control, and she can recognize the control. So Jesus was saying he was aware of their plan. He was actually nourishing himself from these forces. Milk is a secretion, like we secrete milk to feed a baby, yes. but an egg has life. The evidence is, when you crack the shell of an egg, it cries. It has already been proven by instruments today at the Baxter Research Foundation. There's a book called The Secret Life of Plants. They are capable of measuring the crying pain of the death of the egg when you crack the shell. It actually cries like a dead child. Mm -hmm. They have measured it. An infertile egg also. Even an infertile egg, because you're cracking the shell. Well, there also is a book, though, I just heard, that speaks of the, uh, uh, the crying of the plants as they are uh, destroyed and harvested. All right. Now field. let's come back to something. Remember <coughs> this. The egg was not singled out to be eaten or was not commanded for man to partake. The plant was. So by virtue of our love for the plant, when we harvest the plant and says, now we are harvesting you for your whole destiny of serving the Lord's creation, they don't cry no more. They cease to cry. They have cried it. They made research in it. Every time they go to harvest, they to call the whole field and tell the whole field, we're coming to harvest you for your full destiny, meaning you, the purpose you were designed for. So that that particular anguish and anxiety pattern is no longer there. This is man's fear transferred to it. Their fear of knowing that he, they're going to be consumed is now released. That's why they call it and the Eastern people call it prashadam, the blessing of the of the, the sustenance, the consecrating of it, restoring it back to its original state of direct command by the Lord of creation, designed for the creation to consume. We are a creation. We were assigned a certain type of a creation to consume as nourishment. But our fear was transferred by the Lord of creation to separate us, to keep us in that state of respect. Now. When we go back and respect the creation, 
and tell them we are doing this now, then there is no bond of reaction there. There is no indigestion reaction. There is no tension. Uh, and it makes you wonder sometimes about mowing the lawn. Or or any of those things, uh, let alone have the trees and we need the lumber. And uh, you get into all this, you think, well, you're, you're not destroying life. You're not. Uh, when you tell them that you are doing it, they don't resent it and they sprout up back and come back. I it, doubt if very many lumbermen do that. Quite <laughs> so. true, but the thing is this the reason why the lumbermen don't do it, and the fault lies not. In the religion, the fault lies in our churchianity, and the fault lies in our language. There was a time when men treated every object in the universe as male and female until he used the word it. Then it lost its intimacy with him. It became a definite non related creature. Anytime we refer to something as an it, we have shut it out from our whole relationship. And therefore, this is living in a state of limbo in consciousness. And until we restore the balance of respect. Now, in French. In French, you know, they have been male and female, even a table. So it's la verre. Yes. La, it's feminine. The glass. But in English, the glass is the glass, and it's just another it. The table is an it, but in French it's la table, la feminine. In the whole of the, the Eastern culture, the yin and the yang, the male-female principle, the whole positive relation, negative, this whole universe is a polarity. The it also exists, you see, positive, negative, neutral, but that neutralness is only reserved for God not for his creation. We have taken away the, the, the right of God to act upon his creation by imposing the neutralness upon it with our own minds, by using the semantic of it and classifying it. Only God, the creative intelligence, has reserved the word it for its own integrity. Man doesn't have that right to impose it upon anything. Therefore, he has a conflict in his uh, environment. As the science is being accumulating and the facts are being exposed to us about what we've done to ourselves, then a sense of re-evaluation is occurring now in man's mind, that he has to treat everything now on a more intimate base. So Schweitzer pointed the road by saying, we have to develop a reverence and an intimacy for life around us. And later on, it was Carlson Wade and Margaret Mead who broke the intellectual uh, animosity of the scientific world and forced them to accept parapsychological evidence and give it a sense of new values which would have kept us a long way of trying to relate on the scientific level that this thing is not an we still go ahead and think of it as now you've got scientists working with objects in their lab that handling life cultures to work with, and they don't treat those beakers anymore as a nip. They know something happens when they treat it like that, these, these cultures die faster. I know Schweitzer even objected to someone killing an ant that was prowling up his garment. Mm -hmm. He says, after all, it was my ant. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, he, the only time he would permit spraying was when he was performing surgery, mm -hmm. and uh, all he had to have was sterile seal, and uh, uh, a relative of his said that he would permit spraying in the uh, uh, operatory. So you see, the he had a, a real reverence for, for anything alive. It pains me how how birds are being killed with I don't see too many of them around now. Huh? I don't see too many birds around here, so polluted. Not in the air, no. It, we take, we have birds, but we don't have barn 
and they live near people because they live in in a, in a, on a building, mm -hmm. and they live near people, and people are bound to do, feel they have to kill mm -hmm. uh, insects, which are their only food. And in the last uh, twelve and a half years, where we live, although we have vines all around us, I've only heard one vine fall. Oh, Very, very, very. Purple mountains, chimney fish. They don't eat the It's like when, when Hurricane Carla came through Texas, as soon as they knocked down all the buildings and left the place almost desolate, a swarm or the flocks of uh, starlings came into the city of Galveston. And right away the city fathers decided to poison them and try to get rid of them. And the starlings were driven away. It was not that more than an hour after. The whole town was invaded by rats. And then they realized they couldn't kill the rats and they had to go get some starlings. They had to turn loose on hundreds of thousands of dollars of starlings to get rid of the rats. Because they couldn't, they had no way to stop it. They didn't know where it was coming from. They couldn't put out enough uh, decon or anything to kill them off or get rid of them or drive them or burn them out. And one of the naturalists told them, nature had a tent. The right creature took an advance for the problem. But you drove them away. Now you got to spend the money to get flocks of starlings to come back. Maryland has mm -hmm. had uh, millions of darlings, and uh, everybody has been wishing to drive them away. And they do. They're going to be highly surprised on what the rats will do to come out. There is a balance in everything in nature to handle it. Thank you. Thank you. When our retreat starts,
Could you say just a little bit about uh, the current uh, flap of two pros that are going on, and just where they fit into the platform, if at all? Man? <coughs> One of the 84 million. There are only two flesh forms animal and man. Male and female is in man, male and female is in an animal. Extraterrestrial beings are in the man species. So they are of man. So they're on the same physical level that we're on. Well, that's a broad statement. Man species is an entire different thing altogether. We don't comprehend that. We are human evolving into manhood. We use animal models for our behavior levels. You will say of me, I eat like a, but you'll never use a man model. I may see of you, you walk like you. When you change the model in your mind, you will evolve from human to man. But we are in the man level. We are flesh. But uh, there are only two types. animal and the man type. And the bridge is human still relating to the animal models for his behavior. Uh, extraterrestrial is just a label for what? Our naiveness for thinking we're the only creatures on the earth that know it all. Let's be blunt. Right? Can you tell us about their world? Their world? What's so different about it? <laughs> hmm? well, they fly around in UFOs, we drive around in cars. All labels for things that we don't comprehend. <laughs> They're like the primitive man living on the island in his war canoe and his tom toms and his sticks and his spears. Never seen an aquanaut getting off a, a boat or a submarine, either an extraterrestrial or extra island creature. Mm -hmm. And 
got a boomstick that does fire and he flips around in a, a boat on the ocean that has a smokestack and his windows are round that's our version of things that we don't know it's the same with the primitive man's version of a civilized man in his boat primitive man's version of a launch that is powered by an ever root engine would be exactly our version of all primitive uh, crafts and our boom sticks versus these creatures uh, other beings uh, ability to maneuver space we're labeling things we're not looking at anything we're not seeing let alone not realizing we're busy labeling it so what did a primitive man label the object when he saw on the Pacific Ocean, a USO, a non-identified sailing object. <laughs> we call it an unidentified flying object. The word is right, unidentified. To sail or fly. And it's an object because you can't really get close to it. How long will it take us to evolve to the point? It's like saying to us the same thing with the, uh, the Polynesian man to uh, an American sailor on his uh, warship or his uh, uh, ship of hope going around here. How long are they get together to talk to each other? Chief Mukbuk will say, all oh, boys, let's go get them. Bunch of scalps tonight. And the others say, let's fire a, a salvo over their head and keep them off. We are in a safe position. They're obviously uh, far more advanced technically than we are. Are they necessarily more evolved spiritually? Putting back the same question between you, the Polynesian man in his canoe, and you and your uh, <laughs> ship of hope. You good, you see? We are talking like the Polynesians here. And we are assuming that these unidentified objects are more evolved than us and more or less morally developed enough. We don't know. And we're going to go through a lot of drunken uh, hallucinations that we made contact with them. In the first place, if a Polynesian man came face to face with a Nakwanak, you'd want to kill him because he's a strange water creature. He's coming out in an element that he knows He's not too safe and how dare he crawl around in his water. How dare they fly around in our airspace. Isn't that what we're seeing in the Pentagon today? So we have a command, intercept and destroy. We don't tell you that though. But that is on the books. The Air Force has the command to intercept and destroy. No way. We're going to accept any object flying around here. Just as no way Chief Makmak is going to accept that Nak is not sailing around or swimming around in the lagoon. It's a funny phenomenon of fear. Yet we're going to broadcast and say we want to encounter or seek out extraterrestrial life now. Or how are we going to bridge this communication? How are we going to do it? When Chief Makmak decides to invite these aquanauts off the boat to come ashore and get fresh water, he got to do something of a tremendous gesture. How are you going to go about doing it? The other chieftains and the other people on the island will kill him because he's selling out from underneath. That's how he would be behaving. That's how he would behave. same mental patterns. We only change our dresses and change our habitations. Well, have we change our attitudes to each other? What? 
in the first place if we, we landed and we made any contact who would be the guinea pig in the pen who would be the monkey in the cage Galactic man. The galactic man. Yeah, the aquanaut too. They'll put a halter around his neck, pull him through the streets, put him on display, ship him around in a crate. Mm -hmm. Got all kind of labels, the greatest wonder since uh, <laughs> Ripley, believe it or not. We're never going to get down and face each other because our fears are too great. And we're never going to admit to ourselves that technology is, is uh, inadequate. So it's easier to shoot down and ask questions after. Only human, not man. But they're so far advanced, then why do they even bother with that? If we are so advanced, why do we bother to explore the ocean wrong in the Pacific? <coughs> Same question applies to us. We are more advanced than the Polynesian people in their little island. Why do we go scouting wrong in their coral reefs? Simply because we don't have a type of coral reef around where we live that is going to give us information of the ocean floor. Basic fact. They don't have planets like with the same terrain formation and necessary magnetic waves that are similar in the atmosphere that allow them from where they come from to explore and use. So this happened to be Terra, one of the heavenly bodies moving through space within a certain solar system that acts as a feasting ground for their equipment or their and they explore it. We're just another little Pacific island in their consciousness. A bunch of primitives. Humanoids growing up. Well, what is there you know, to rain life? What do they do on that planet? All right, in primitive man in the Polynesian island, he has no skyscraper. He didn't cut down in the jungle to make it in an asphalt jungle and pollute it with smoke and blast where it's going. So. He lives on vegetables and fruits and possible a wild pig now and then. He has no cannery, he has no refrigeration, he has no automated uh, soda pop machines, he has no dollars and cents to punch. We live in the uh, asphalt jungle, our air is polluted, and we survive on uh, vitamin pills and uh, canned food and TV dinners. So, on Earth, we appear to be eating a certain type of food, living within a certain type of atmosphere, and breathing a certain type of uh, gas to survive. These individuals may be living in an emetian atmosphere or a sulfuric atmosphere. Their life support system will be different, simply because they polluted theirs and burn out the oxygen of theirs. No. They don't eat what we eat. They may be using sapphire, ground up sapphire, ground up uh, lapis lazuli, ground up uh, granite. They have a different digestive reaction in their system. Is it like Star Trek? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the way that, you know, the Star Trek is a pure <laughs> juvenile imitation of what's going on. Mm -hmm. Very little yeah, immature, <laughs> an immature thing of what is happening there. Yes, yeah, very, very true. That's why it's called mm -hmm. illusion Maya. Mm -hmm. We are only relative to one point of time and space and one needs. And we think we know it all in this realm. We don't know nothing. Mm -hmm. We're just becoming aware of a lot of things mm -hmm. about ourselves. We're coming out of the animal models of ourselves and our animal behavior patterns and tendencies trying to grow up into human or man models. We don't even have enough man models for our behavior. 
When you see a baby born, what do you say when it smiles like a what? Yeah, well, you have that one? <laughs> yeah, I know. That's what I thought. Then you met a UFO if you saw one. <laughs> you have to feel like that. Yeah, that's what we With our suburbia and everything now. Don't we want to get back to, to the green pasture land, the paradisal uh, type of living? And what do they want? It's exactly what we're trying to do. We want to get up there to explore and uh, lower ourselves. And they want to get away from their methane, sulfuric, and dioxide, different types of life support systems, only to get back to pure oxygen environment. Can we send an astronaut from here to the moon and hope for him to survive without that him carrying his own life support system? If we did, after a while, he'll alter his own features for lack of it. They've already got evidence. If he stays too long in space, his molecular structure will start changing. His ears will elongate. His jaw will start spreading out. And before you know it, you'll have what is looking like a distorted animal features. So we come back to pre-assumption that in Atlantean time, men altered men to look like animals. They didn't alter them. They just didn't know the laws of surviving with minus oxygen star starvation. The cells will change their shape and their retention and their pressures will alter. Because the life support system would, would be different. Will they eventually land and stay down here? If we were, if they're fast enough to get by us. Hmm. Yeah. In the first place, the city of Detroit has a law passed last year. Any unidentified object found flying within the airspace of Detroit, the local police has the right to fly and give it a blue ticket. And the ticket is blue for interrupting the noise level. Now this is a law that is passed. It's not joking. It's a little law for buzzing homes. The governor put it into effect. When you hear a thing like that, you know really how ridiculous we can get. All right. Now, the two men that were picked up in Pascagoula by the UFO and went through all the uh, post-hypnotic uh, tests to see that they weren't hallucinating. How was the description of the creatures that they saw? He looked humanoid, but he had an animal face. This has been uh, an accumulation of knowledge of other cultures and things like this that causes uh, the individual flat patterns to change. Yes, a lot of things cause us to change too. You eat meat, your skin is coarse and tough and dry. You start eating a lot of vegetables, it gets smooth and silky and velvety. You live on oxygen and you have a certain particular shape and form and hold it. Shift from oxygen to other different forms of life support and the texture and the shape and this body will go through different changes because each has a different re toxic reaction and the reaction have a different distortion so what are we supposed to work on <laughs> we only look in relation to our ideation of our models in our mind, and we don't know what the true model of our self is. This is why everybody's making such a mess. <laughs> <laughs> Your skull always looks the same when you tear off the skin out of it. The skeleton looks the same. There are certain segments. 
But does the skin look the same in everybody? Does the texture look the same? Does the hair look the same? When you look at me, and have no concept of anatomy, you wouldn't believe I can take a piece of rub and push it through my nose and take it out through my mouth. There is no visible way that your mind will conceive of it, having no concept of anatomy. And some joker is called a yogi comes along with a wax pot, pushes it through here, take it out through here, no idea. And you say, gosh, man, that's a miracle. You do nothing new. Doctors are doing it every day to keep you from choking in operation. The thing is hollow. All right, take this hand. Do you see any possibility of driving a nail right through here to the other side without breaking the board? Yeah. Why? I don't know. I just heard you saying only because you've been exposed to it before or heard of it, but you got no real visual experience that that will be. You'll always be doubtful of the possibility of doing it. You'll always fear you'll be pop the bones. Until you know the anatomy, you know the measurements, the geometry, you're not going to attempt to push a nail right through here and come on the other side. And not just any other nail. It has to be a certain size, a certain shape. For it to go through. Come on the other side without breaking the bone. Yeah. What is the true model? There is no true model for me. Why are you smarter than we are? Hmm? <coughs> Who is smarter than you? Who is smarter than you? Ask yourself the question. Man's possible. Well, these UFOs that, that land, they, they claim they can stop on a dime, all right? They can go at tremendous speeds. Uh -huh. We can't do things like that. Those are our things. That doesn't say you're smarter than you. Who say you're... The difference between a feat and who we are. Mm -hmm. It's the difference between an action, you know, even if you want to take that astronaut landing or whatever it is on a dime. So what? That's a feat. That's not... Well, does, that, does that make that astronaut who he is? Right. Well, I, I don't know. You see, the thing is this. Man's possible evolution, man, possible evolution from the human level to full manhood lies within his spinal column. Now, within your spinal column, you have the key to internal evolution of manhood. Now, any being who appears to be ultra smart or ultra educated or with higher technological background merely did one simple thing. Increase the velocity rate of the spinal flow from the coccyx to the brain by virtue of the location on the planet or where he came from. Some do it by natural law, others do it by controlled environmental equipment, but it's still understanding natural law. You sound asleep at night, will take a whole year to evolve your brain to comprehend a little bit of change of nature. Others do the holy breath, and one registration changes their brain. So who is smarter? Hmm? <laughs> well, this is what we're talking about. You see? The brain is increased 
every seven years, the body changes every seven years, cellular wise. Isn't that what our scientist tells us? Yeah. All right. Did the scientist actually change the cells of a human body every seven years? What did he arrive at? A conclusion or a deduction or a result of an experiment? What did he arrive at? Did he arrive at the result of an experiment that he performed on your body, knowing seven years can get a change, or you arrive at a conclusion or a deduction? Say a conclusion. From a long series of what? Tests. Tests. Only to prove what he originally started out to deny. Somebody's got to tell him that the human body changes every seven years. And he's got to start out denying it. Till he ends up doing what? And then he proves it, what does he say? Yeah, you're right. But it, we got hold of it now. We got the right to say it, not you. It's legal. It's medically factual. So the bureaucrats and the big office and the policy makers back him up. And we live with the naiveness now. Only they have the right to say that the thing is right. And any attempt to say it by any other media, is a violation of the FDA. This is how we live and think. And we don't even realize we're doing it ourselves. We have already set up all the agencies to Isolate us away from human contact to the point we're getting to be like a physical flesh machine. Mm -hmm. We're doing it ourselves. It's very, very tragic. But this is our so called life in which we find ourselves. Will it ever change? Within the next 30 years, anyway? Change is made by sacrifice. And how many are willing to sacrifice themselves for their fellow men to bring a change? <laughs> a lot of people would have to go and think the same. Yes, we are living in an illusion and we are deluded by it, hence it's called relativity. For instance, all right, what is this object? That's a nice <laughs> name for it. <laughs> a nice name for it. What is a paperweight? <laughs> My foot could be a paperweight. What is it made from? What is steel made from? Iron. And what is iron made from? Atoms. And what is atoms made from? Energy. And what does energy come from? God. Where does God come from? That's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> you see? No matter where we go, we're going to end up with the nameless question or the questionless question. By no stroke of the mind can you solve your creation. You will always end up in a state of verballess communication. Yeah. Right, feeling. You go back to feeling. 
Well, we're not you're really supposed to understand the thing. Supposed you're supposed to stand yeah. under it. Mm. If you're going to get anything, get understanding, but not comprehension in the sense of the word that you're going to decipher it and analyze it and pick it apart and think you can yeah. put it. You get to be able to stand under the processes of flow. And in its flow, you realize its magnitude, which is greatness. Then you're free. That's what brings freedom. The freedom of not trying to decipher it. The freedom of it occurring spontaneously, continuously, in your immediate awareness. It's called the nameless void. In some books they call it Anamlo, in other books they call it Nirvana, in some books they call it Beingness, mm. or the hairness of hair. It's just got to go through white hair being stupid. That's what the poet said. Mine is not the reason why, mine is to do and live. But if he, he used the word die, he was not referring to cease to live. He was referring to die in the sense of ceasing to hold on to all ideas about yourself. So don't reason about the process and try to get uptight about it. The process is going on. The process is supposed to live in it. And how we live in it is evolution. You're making not progress. So you're too hung up with the world, you're trying to make progress. It's not progress we're trying to do in life. We're trying to relate to our environment by the <coughs> by various techniques of utilization for the benefit of keeping ourselves in a happy frame of mind. So if I want to talk to you, and you live, say, 10 miles from here, and I took a drum and I did boom, 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 and you did back boom, boom, boom. <laughs> so for the sake of utilization, I'll run a piece of wire from your house to my house 10, 10 miles, and then we put two tin cans, and we pull it, twing, twing. <laughs> now we, we found a way how we can magnetize it. What have we got? Then uh, the wires are too expensive because you can't find all the cup in the ground when you need it. So you decide to get rid of the wire and make a, a radio phone. It's not progress. It's just techniques of utilization for survival. So you're supposed to accept the whole thing and be happy and just go on your merry way? Yes, the happiness is that the it's getting each other closer to oneness. We live in a one world, in a one unified process, but we are separated by our technological differences. Would you agree that acceptance is the key to the total acceptance now of the here and now? Is the key to the happiness of you know, to be at peace. Yes. Total acceptance is total surrender, which is the key to be happy all the time. Not resignation. No, no, not resignation. Resignation is a uh, denial. Uh -huh. but acceptance but is a positive involvement. Mm -hmm. You're emerging from your weaknesses when you accept the challenge. The man who was given five talents and went out and doubled it and made five more was an acceptance of challenge. The one who hid his under the bed was a denial, a resignation. No more can be got from it. So what did he get? The consciousness took it back from him. So life is challenged. Life is venturesome. Life is unfolding. Only when we accept the unfoldment. And it sustains us. A plant can't continue to grow if we don't have more seeds in it. If you cook the seeds, the seeds are not going to sprout up. So, the continuation of the plant is based upon the essence of the plant. The continuation of our existence is based on the essence of our nature. 
And spiritual teachers only come to tell us this, that this is not our real home. This illusion is not our real home. This illusion is a temporary stomping ground, a temporary way station between one level of beingness to another level of beingness. But we are so attached to the level of beingness of the senses that we can't detach ourselves to, to the level of beingness outside of the sensory nature or independent of the sensory nature. If we were to be able to comprehend the light for one minute, one second, and I feel this, this is not hysterical, but dead needed, and to take in all that we could possibly take in in that one minute, if we could keep it and isolate it, I'm talking about perception, I'm talking about being aware of everything that is involved as compared to how we usually go from minute to minute. I'm trying to tie this into the now. You know, the human that, that principle. Are we talking about the same thing? Yes, we're talking the same thing, just with different semantics. Well, yeah, I use the different, you know. Yeah, we're, we're saying the same thing, the same thing. Yeah. What is our true home? <clears throat> our true home is called now. Not be here, I just said be here. I use one word, not three words. From moment to moment? I didn't say from moment to moment. Now has nothing to do with moments. The word now encompasses everything. Both beingness and going and coming in beingness. Now. Think of it. Become aware of what now is. Such Khan only means the abode of God. And where is the abode of God existing? Yeah. If I said your your home is the Such Khan, the abode of God, you would, your mind subconsciously would ask the question, but objectively you you wouldn't you not ask the question because you think you will sound stupid. Your objective mind would not ask the question because you'll think the answer will come back to you and make you look stupid. Your subconscious mind is asking the question, where is this abode of God? Where is this such God located? No, there's no third eye. It's now. Our abode of God is now. Where is the kingdom of God located? Jesus said, Thy kingdom, what? Come. All right. Figure out the word come. Do you see any difference between the word now and come? Now, I've got to I just want, you know, to You're feeling it, but you can't verbally relate it. Let's admit to ourselves there is no way you're going to verbally relate now and come. No. So no, don't. No motion. Mo motion, not emotion. Motion. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Oh, all right. So God has another name. He's called Akal. Akal is called time. The negative pull. And God in his true nature is Akal, the timeless pull. Where is timelessness located? No. And where is now <laughs> located? Here. And that's come. Um, not a word game. No, not a word game. It's a feeling relation. The words die out in their importance 
when the feeling takes over because we are soul we don't have soul that's why feeling takes over I, I, I followed you about the Vietnam now, and how you tie, I don't understand how quite how you tied in come. I was following you up to a... Jesus said, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth. But he just said, this the planet earth. Mm -hmm. Thy will be done in manifestation. Earth is solidity, a tangible expression of nameless energy which must occur in now and will means desire to act the craving to act the you power to act desire, okay? yeah. so thy kingdom come and what is the kingdom <laughs> so now is the true home of the soul now it's present tense, not past, not future. And now is also not present. Because now is endlessness, infinity. <coughs> so, centering yourself in feeling, you always live now. You're not living yesterday and you're not living tomorrow because these will never occur. There will only be illusions of the mind. Now is the feeling, now is the reality, now is the only true essence of your nature. But you have to live it, you got to feel it. You got to make every physical action part of it. Then you are free, free men of Lord of yourself. Call no man master, save the Lord which is in you. And the Lord in you is the nowness of you. Until you experience the nowness in yourself, you don't know what it is to be a master of yourself. You'll always be disturbed and be pulled and you'll always be weak and you'll always be confused and always be worrying. The total awareness of now, of the now. I used to think, you know, being master of yourself, you know, that and probably you still got overcoming obstacles of, you know, growing up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but where are you going to grow up? That's it. <laughs> You're growing up in the now with what? <laughs> the reaction of now is. Growing, huh? growing up. Okay. See, growing all this occurs in now. Is this candle burning tomorrow? No. Is it burning yesterday? So what is burning? Yeah. Nowness is doing the burning. No, there is no moment to moment. Nowness is doing the burning between what? The illusory form of wax within the, the light principle and the sound principle that acts as a flame. It took a match that you had to strike to ignite from sound into light to induce a thermal condition called burning. Could you say that it used the, the resources of the now? Yes. The, uh, we are using all of the resources of now and therefore it's infinite. It's not going to be run out and so we're never going to have no shortages. That's that kind of energy. <laughs> <laughs> it's happening now. But we are in different time frames of it. So our time frame creates our survival patterns and creates our anxiety patterns. If your time frame is in proper sequence and proper synchronization, what have you got? Success. If the time frames are incorrect and they're out of synchronization, you have failure. No success. If you were supposed to meet a man at the airport at 6 o'clock and he had a, a check for you and you owe a thousand dollars and he would give me a thousand and ten, 
but you got to be there at six o'clock. Let's go. All right. <laughs> the, the time frame determines the success <laughs> of receipt. Right? That's all. Just being simple and objective about the thing. Mm -hmm. The idea of going for the check, being on time at six o'clock, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, still yeah. I chose to go in. Right. The time is success, and yet done, it's It's completed and it's perfect. Yeah. And so perfection is now, and completion is now. There's, it's not futuristic, neither is it past. So we can take little relative action, you know, that we perform from day to day. And Actually, reckon, day, 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 right? Know, from time. <laughs> <laughs> from time frame to time frame. Yeah. All right. All right. You know, and, and, and live day, and live the the successfulness of now. Live the joyousness, or the realization, or the freedom of now. You're always going to be happy. Jesus says, be, be cheerful, for I have overcome the world. And it's a world too, not the one W-O-R-L-D, it's a W-H-I-R-L. What's the W-H-I-R-L? The spin, the pull between, the push and pull between yesterday and tomorrow. Be of good cheer, be cheerful. Maintain this the essence of your nowness and you're free from this momental spin, this centripetal centripetal force, this out and in movement, this rolling condition of your environment. Then you are free. So once you're cheerful and you don't let this push and pull, the anguish and the agony of it get you. It'll come out. And it has a certain time frame, and it's photo finish. And photo finish is still now. We can never get out of the now. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, because everything is uh, cosmic economics, well balanced to fit. No more, no less. It's positive points. That's why I said we have to change our concepts of living and our concepts in relation to economics of money too. Our fears are centered upon like the man who got one talent and buried it. He was afraid to take a chance. And our society is designed in such a way we have to take a chance if we don't want it. The tax structure is set up that you got to take a chance. So, the old systems of living, where the security is based on pay as you go, is no longer a practical condition for the realized men. It's only practical for the semi-realized men. The fully realized man works like God. How God works. He takes a gamble on a universe that didn't have no form, only for the form to turn around and curse him. <laughs> you see, he knows pretty well that his creation was going to call him all kinds of names and everything, but he holds the poor strings, he still holds the principle, the interest. So that's the key to today's system of living with the economics around us. You borrow money, you feel you're in debt, because that's your sense of reference. You're not in debt. What you're really doing, you're buying time. And in buying time, you're acquiring equity. And by acquiring equity, you are living out of it to fill the bodily needs in order to use it as a bargaining leverage for something bigger. That's the new approach to the economics of spiritual living. The masters all use it. They don't pay as they go, you know. I was under that illusion one time till I found out they all laugh at me and says, come on man, 
You think you can dream up of something that the world is working with that God don't work the same way? God is the biggest loan insurance company. Right. Time. Right. Time. Right. right. <laughs> He's busy sponsoring the whole universe on credit. <laughs> your social credit is as good as your integrity to pay your rental, not pay your bills. We are renting everything in this universe because we can't care to us when we die. Therefore, we can't own anything. We can only bargain on a leverage level with objects. So we change our whole sense of focus with our possessions. We don't have possessions no more. The philosophy is to teach us that we don't possess anything. But we start out with the insecurity of trying to say, this one little thing, I paid for it, it's mine, I go hold on to it now and I can pass it out to my ears. <laughs> My ears may take the thing and throw it in the garbage. <laughs> and I gave my life for it. So when I realized that that is not the true essence of the spiritual life, the essence of the spiritual life is to flow and let it work, then we begin to get a new sense of references. And then the man who went out with five talents will make ten. The one who went out with two will make four. The one who had won will have it taken back. This is the new principle in thinking, and you know, the teachers of truth just making us more conscious of the divinity and the magnitude of our spirit. So don't be afraid of it and uh, take a chance and always travel with a spare tire. <laughs> always travel with a spare tire. Yeah. <laughs> that means. Be cautious too, but don't be uh, afraid. And the big difference between caution and be afraid. So now with the concept, you're talking about. No. Yeah. All right. Good. Very interesting. Very good. Interesting word now. You know that word now carries the criteria of accomplishment? All right, but within it, it carries the maximum reward of accomplishment. Spell the word backwards, you'll see now. Now, oh, one, one, now, and win. The O-W stands backwards. Yeah, one. When you want something, what have you got? So the word itself is dualistic and it's all purposefully positive. There's no negativeness about it. There's no negativeness in God. He's now, and once you get him, you won the game. Who can be better off than than being with him? Yeah, that's, that's it, but we don't want to be like a child, we want to be like some giant computer. <laughs> and we go around all in the levels of different emotions, trying to allocate our devotions, when the thing is so simple. As we weed ourselves away from the rituals and the different time frames, and start to see ourselves in the simpleness of it, then we got the freedom, the free mind, or not the cluttered mind, the free mind to work, the free mind that allows the spirit to flow. We don't want a mind that is busy telling God how to run his universe. We want to have a free mind, an uncluttered mind that allows him to run it through us. Then we don't need to uh, constantly hammering away at ourselves about intellectual things. The intellectual things will take care of themselves because it's only games you play with semantics. Right. <laughs> you know, I remember one time I read the. There were, there's a man called Dr. Johnson. He wrote a book, and the first few uh, sentences in the book was this: "Juvenile, extricate that quadruped." <laughs> Juvenile. Juvenile. Yeah, extricate. extricate that quadruped <laughs> from the piazza. That's my PID, P I A D. E exterminate its vitality. Oh my! 
Get that kid out there, boys. You see how he went all around the way to tell us something? Well, you can do it. You can be done if you want to spend the time. It reminds me of somebody who was uh, speaking of the house that Jack built. They looked up in the dictionary all the various words. They used the most complicated word they could. They started, this is the domicile that John erected, and they went through the whole yeah. <laughs> 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 Well, you said something about the sound current that we hear and the significance of it. The sound current is the audible life stream or life energy, which is audible from the internal air but it's ultrasonic that's why it's in a different dimension but it's audible from the internal ear and that life stream is god god is life but god is sound you see he is the uh, distal ultrasonic waves and these waves are responsible these are energies, rhythms of energies that are responsible for the various rates of vibrations that form our universe. You see, the first manifestation of the ultrasonics, which is whirling or spiraling, that's why it's whirling or spiraling, from a nameless means that you can't tag it, uh, motion state the first expression is vibration and that vibration has a hum mm. it's called the cosmic hum or cosmic sound so it's audible now it's like a hum of a big dynamo and it permeates the universe this single force field and becomes elements or atoms and the vibratory rate or acceleration is responsible for the variations of manifestations in a state of polarity that is our audible life current now this principle is only in residence that is to say it is capable of self-recognition. The residency means it's capable of self-recognition in man, hum this type of tissue. It's passing through every form of life, every variation or every manifestation, but it's not self-recognizable in all of them, only in one. It's self-recognizable in man. A plant is closer to it by its fiber nature or structure. Therefore, a fiber structured object can pick up all the life flow in the universe and telegraph it back and forth. And they telegraph to the animal kingdom first. And last is the man kingdom. But because the man kingdom is self recognizable to the sun current, the animal does not clobber the man on the head and make him respect him. The sound current in the plant does not dictatorially affect man. It is man who has the sound current in a self-recognizable state, usurps the dictatorial attitude of clobbering the plant, cut it when he wants it, do what he wants to do. But the sound current by itself flowing through the atmosphere can clutter up your garden with a bunch of weeds tomorrow. You see? <laughs> That's how the, the plant kingdom gets back at you. Just. Now this is the sun current. And it is called the Christ in man. See, that's the Christ in man, the actual sun current. It's the master consciousness, the audible life current. It's focused at the point between the eyebrow as a resonator but it's audible 
in terms of the flow of the blood because the life is in the blood on the right side of the brain which means sitting on the right side of the father father being the centrum or focal point where the energy beams in on the brain now since the life blood it's in the life blood and the life blood moves down on the left side of the brain then it travels down as light light travels down light doesn't travel up light is always a tra it appears to be moving up in the world of illusion but in the world of actuality it's moving down it's following the course of the blood and sound is moving up so in the world of illusion sound appears to be going down and light appears to be going up but in the world of actuality light is moving down and sound is moving up because the world we're in is a reflection yes the world we're in is a reflection of the actuaries of the of creation is this what john was speaking about saint john in the, the gospel in the beginning was the word and the word was with god and the word was god yes in the beginning was the ultrasonic frequencies or vibratory rates that express itself in a whirling or spiraling condition and from this spiralic condition we have different rates of vibrations and the different rates of vibrations then go to the next condition called elements in their atomic nature and then from the element down through the last form flesh where it's in resident and it is self-recognizable only in the human form it is self-recognizable in other forms it's not self-recognizable that means they